Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on the diagnosis and the treatment of epilepsy resulting from periventricular nodular heterotopia. I am Nitin Tandon. I'm a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery um, at uh, McGovern Medical School at UT Health uh, and I co-direct the Texas Institute of Restorative Neurotechnologies with my friend and colleague Dr. Sam Latu. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Sam Latu. I'm a professor of neurology at McGovern Medical School at UT Health, and I'm also co-director of the Texas Institute for Restorative Neurotechnologies, along with Dr. Tandon. We're going to walk you through uh, the disorder that we're interested in today, periventricular nodular heterotopia. We recognize it's a mouthful, uh, but it's a very specific terminology for a disorder that occurs in brain development. The brain, the human brain, all mammalian brains start off as a hollow tube that uh, forms very early on in embryology and then folds in various complex ways to achieve its desired size and shape in a newborn baby. This tube, though, starts off with cells that line its boundaries, and these cells then migrate or move in a radial fashion to get to their targets in the cortex. And interestingly, uh, the lowest layers of the cortex get organized first, and then the upper layers do. And as these cells migrate, they make connections with each other to form the brain that we are used to. This is just the difference between a mouse brain and a human brain, showing that the same processes operate. And this process of migration is facilitated by glial cells, which are the cells that support the brain cells, and the brain cells migrate along them to their surface. Well, like in most things, sometimes this process doesn't go as desired, and this migrational process is disrupted due to a variety of different factors. Um, a whole bunch of disorders can result from this migrational abnormality, and today we're going to focus on this particular abnormality where these brain cells do not migrate out from the ventricle and actually get trapped next to this fluid space as nodules or as sheets next to this ventricle space. And since they're next to the ventricle, they're periventricular. And since they're usually nodules, they're called nodular. And heterotopia means that they're heterotopic in location uh, relative to where they were supposed to be. Of course, very similar migrational abnormalities can result in other abnormalities of the brain, but that is beyond our discussion for today. This is an example of what these nodules look like grossly in a section of the brain uh, and how they get trapped. This disorder has a female predominance and often results in seizures in about 80 to 90 percent of cases, which uh, generally start around the teenage years in most people. People can be perfectly normal uh, intellectually um, and very often these disorders can be associated with heart abnormalities, and coagulation problems as well. There are a variety of such malformations like we just illustrated, and of all of those malformations, heterotopias occupy about 15%. So give or take one out of every seven persons with a brain malformation will have periventricular nodular heterotopia. So it's not an uncommon problem, and very often it results in drug-resistant epilepsy, epilepsy that does not respond to the administration of a variety of different medications. People often wonder, well, why me? Why did I get this? And it's very clear that uh, PVNH is a genetic abnormality. It's not necessarily something you get from your parents. It could be a mutation that occurs very early on in development. So you could have either <clears throat> a mutation in the parent that gets passed on, a mutation that occurs in the child, a, a somatic mutation in the eggs or in the sperm, and then uh, mut somatic mutations that only occur in the brain tissue. There are a variety of different genes and abnormalities associated with PVNH uh, that have been characterized, but for the most part, we don't completely understand which genes are abnormal in which individual, and this is still a uh, area of much study. As you might imagine, these abnormal brain cells, when they don't get to their destination and make the connections that they normally would be expected to, uh, 
still fire and still make activity, and this activity is often abnormal, which is why they result in the genesis of seizures. So these seizures can occur either in the nodule itself or simultaneously in both the overlying cortex and the nodule. Uh, and this highly synchronized abnormal activity is a hallmark of PVNH. So with this, I want to hand over to Dr. Latou, who's going to talk us through a specific case that illustrates our points. Thank you, Dr. Tandon. Um, the case I'm going to discuss is very typical of how these patients present in the epilepsy clinic. Our patient is a 36-year-old right-handed lady who has had seizures for a long time. These are characterized by staring spells. Initially, she had no warning beforehand, but now she has auras of anxiety. She stops talking, or if she's speaking in English, she reverts to Spanish and has no knowledge of these events. She has three such seizures per week, and she very occasionally has uh, grand mal or generalized tonic-clonic seizures. She is intractable or she is medically resistant uh, to treatment and has been on several anti-seizure drugs such as oxcarbazepine, aptium, levetiracetam, and lamotrigine. And again, this is very typical of this condition where repeated medication trials fail to help the seizures for any length of time. Um, importantly, and in light of what Dr. Tandon just discussed, um, there is no significant family history in this particular patient. Her examination, of course, is normal, uh, but her MRI scan is very revealing, as you can see outlined by these red circles. She has nodules uh, on both sides of the brain that we think might be responsible for her seizures. In other words, she has periventricular nodular heterotopia. Once she goes to the epilepsy monitoring unit and has her EEG done, it quickly becomes apparent that she indeed has epileptic discharges. These seem to be coming from the left temporal lobe, uh, not the nodules because these are so deep. And again, this is typical of this condition where these epileptic discharges appear in regions that are not necessarily close to where the nodules uh, might be. This might result in misdiagnosis, particularly if the nodules have not been spotted before. So in this particular patient, uh, the sharp waves uh, indicating her epileptogenicity arise from the left temporal region, in particular electrodes F7 and FT9. So in the epilepsy monitoring unit, once her medication is reduced, she very quickly starts having seizures, and she has a total of three of these recorded in the epilepsy monitoring unit. These are all characterized by automatisms, uh, so we refer to these seizures as automotor seizures. And if we look in the left temporal chain here, we can see in the posterior temporal region a theta rhythm building up that then spreads throughout the left hemisphere and eventually to the other side as well. So you can see in this particular patient, we have the typical phenotype of intractability. Uh, we see that her seizures mimic uh, seizures arising from other parts of the brain because the seizures spread from the nodules to those regions. So these regions could be uh, adjacent. They could even be far away. So in other parts of the temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, uh, for example. It's worth bearing in mind in patients who have otherwise normal MRI scans that sometimes these nodules can be very subtle and indeed sometimes it can be a single nodule that is responsible for the patient's um, epilepsy. So once we've made the diagnosis and we've confirmed uh, that the patient has epileptic seizures uh, arising, likely arising from these nodules, uh, we go through a checklist. So what do we do next? It's very important to determine the family history. As Dr. Tandon mentioned, uh, in the classic form, um, about 50% of our patients have the so-called filament 1 uh, gene mutation. Uh, there is typically a high incidence of spontaneous uh, abortions of uh, male uh, fetuses. Other familiar forms uh, also exist. 
And of course, if there's a family history or a history of spontaneous abortions, uh, genetic counseling is something that should be borne in mind. Uh, sometimes there are associated subtle malformations, such as polymicrogyria, hypoplasia, or um, a uh, diminished growth of other parts of uh, the brain that may not be readily uh, evident on the MRI scan, uh, but are seen to be present when uh, looked for. And as Dr. Tandon mentioned, uh, patients can often have other problems, such as cardiac problems and clotting problems, but also breathing problems and lung uh, malformations. These are often evident clinically, but sometimes uh, they may not be readily evident, and at least a chest x-ray uh, is necessary in our patients who have nodular heterotopias. Of course, uh, we have to prove that seizures are coming from the nodules, uh, and so we proceed to further investigations um, that give us more information as to what the true situation is. So a very important investigation is MEG, or magnetoencephalography, and in our patient, you can see uh, that there are MEG clusters, or epileptic activity, on the left side, which is what our EEG indicated, but also on the right side, where we know uh, nodules are present. Here, the burden of disease seems to be more on the left side than the right side. We also undertake neuropsychological testing because we want to know um, in the event that we find seizures are coming not from the nodule, but elsewhere, say, for example, the temporal lobe, we would want to know what the impact of um, surgical intervention in those areas is going to be for the patient post-surgery in terms of memory, language, uh, and so forth. There are other scans that we occasionally request, but these are usually not necessary. There is the PET scan, uh, but in these patients, um, findings are variable and often not clinically helpful. Uh, there is the SPECT scan, which often gives us uh, ideas to where seizures might be coming from in the brain, but not in these particular patients uh, because the nodules are very small and uh, not enough to activate this particular scan. And there is the EEG fMRI, which in fact is a little unwieldy for most uh, clinical centers, and there is not much evidence of its usefulness. So these investigations are usually not uh, necessary. So we move onward to what we call a phase two evaluation where we put electrodes inside the brain, uh, inside the nodules, and in overlying uh, cortex to see where the seizures are coming from. So the general principles are to see if the seizures are indeed coming from the nodules. And since these patients often have nodules on both sides, we want to see whether they're coming from the left, the right, or in fact, both places. Uh, the other possibility is that seizures are coming not only from the nodules, but from overlying cortex, and sometimes from overlying cortex alone, and uh, not the nodules themselves. Uh, rarely, or more rarely, um, the seizures may arise from distant structures, such as the hippocampus. So we seek guidance from all the investigations we've spoken of so far, uh, the most important of these being the MRI scan, the EEG, MEG, and in fact, the seizure features of the patient. And here I'll hand over to my colleague, Dr. Tandon, about the actual surgery. Well, thank you, Dr. Latu, for introducing this patient and for putting in perspective the burden of this disease and how we then need to address this uh, when medications do not work. So as Dr. Latu has shown us, these are deep-seated abnormalities. They are in and around the ventricle, which is typically several centimeters from the outside surface of the brain. Uh, and so the best way of reaching in that depth is the placement of electrodes via a technique called stereoelectroencephalography. So we are in the midst of a revolution in the way epilepsy surgery is performed and this has two components, a minimally invasive localization modality, which is SEEG or stereo EEG, and a minimally invasive technique for destruction of deep lesions that we will then talk about subsequently. So this is Jean Taylorac, who you see here uh, in the operating room with a patient in France. He described this technique in 1965, and it's been in vogue in uh, France and other parts of Europe for the better part of 
30 or 40 years before it made its way across the Atlantic. Um, this traditional approach included a very specific type of frame and very restrictive implantation of electrodes. One of the reasons for its advent in uh, North America is the availability of robotic systems such as this one that allow us to do the implantations faster with more accuracy and with less constraints of where the targets need to be. So uh, robotic SEG has transformed the evaluation of epilepsies of all types, but especially epilepsies originating from deep structures in the brain, which is especially true with periventricular nodular heterotopia. On the top right here, you just see the number of publications resulting from SEEG and how they're rising exponentially over the last several years. <clears throat> We've published some of our own expertise in SEEG, comparing it with the more traditional subdural grid method. And we've shown that it's faster, it's safer, it is better tolerated by patients, and interestingly, is also more effective at localizing seizure foci globally, not just in PVNH. And so for us, this approach on the bottom right here, which is the SEEG approach, where the cranium is not opened, but these small posts with probes inside them are placed into the brain, is the preferred approach rather than the old traditional craniotomy where a large section of the skull needs to be removed and electrodes need to be placed on the surface of the brain. Um, and for the most part, as you can see, of the wide variety of indications for deep lesions, insular, cingulate lesions, in cases where it is important to relate other three-dimensional data with SEEG uh, are all good indications for SEEG. And SEEG is especially valuable in non-lesional cases, in cases where there is no visible abnormality on imaging. Further, we've stretched SEEG in other ways, where we are no longer constrained by the traditional orthogonal implantations to having oblique implantations. And this is especially relevant in the evaluation of deep uh, lesions such as PVNH, where the long axis of the lesion might be along the long axis of the ventricle and therefore much better sampled by electrodes coming in along the long axis rather than orthogonal to the brain surface. And we've also shown recently that such sampling allows us to detect foci that might otherwise be impervious to traditional orthogonal implantations. So in the context of this individual patient that Dr. Latu described, as you'd seen, the lesion was in the left occipital region and temporo-occipital region. And so these electrodes are placed longitudinally into that uh, abnormality. And then other electrodes are placed to sample the neocortex as well as the hippocampus, which is shown here in this bright yellow color, uh, and the amygdala, which uh, are also structures like Dr. Latu alluded to that are involved in uh, seizure genesis or, or amplification in cases of PVNH. Uh, so this is a comprehensive sampling of not just the PVNH, but of the overlying cortex and other associated structures that might be involved in the genesis of the epilepsy. Now, once we have these electrodes implanted, the patient is placed in the epilepsy monitoring unit, and we collect data for up to a couple of weeks in instances. But for the most part, within three to four days, we start recording seizures. And we use that data then to inform next steps. So back to Dr. Latu to talk about the seizures recorded in this individual case. So thank you, Dr. Tandon. Um, as you will recall, when I was uh, talking about the surface scalp EEG of this particular patient in the epilepsy monitoring unit, the seizures seem to be coming from the left temporal lobe. And so it is now contingent upon us to show that the seizures are indeed coming from the nodule rather than from the overlying uh, temporal lobe. And that is what the electrodes placed by Dr. Tandon will help us uh, prove. So what you can see in the intracranial EEG, so these are all electrodes inside the brain. Uh, these electrodes at the bottom here, the bottom 12 channels or so, are channels that are in or in the vicinity of these nodules. Uh, the rest are in overlying cortex and distant cortex. So what we can see very quickly 
um, is that there are profuse epileptic spikes that are coming from this patient's hippocampus. So on the left side, and the hippocampus, of course, is part of the temporal lobe. So um, we understand from this that the hippocampus is involved in the epilepsy. This is the posterior part of the hippocampus showing us the same thing. Now at the bottom here, so these are the nodular electrodes, and you can see also that there is more or less continuous firing of the nodule on the left side. So we know that that is also involved in this patient's uh, epilepsy. Further, when we blow up the um, recordings from the nodule, you can see that there are some very aggressive looking um, discharges from the nodule in this particular patient. And from the MRI scan in different uh, sections, you can see the nodule, the crosshairs are sitting squarely in the nodule, and that is indeed the part of the brain and the part of the nodule that is firing continuously, um, contributing to this person's epilepsy. So we know the left hippocampus is active, we know the left nodule is active, and we now have to wait for seizures. What is also of interest in this particular patient is that the nodule produces what we refer to as high-frequency oscillations. These, in many patients, uh, are indicative of epileptogenicity and can be a signature of the epileptogenic zones or regions of these um, patients. So here is an EEG uh, record of this patient's seizures. You can see the interictal spiking that was going on that we saw before in the hippocampus. But the seizure uh, starts down here in the nodule where we also saw spiking. So here is definitive proof uh, that the seizures are arising in the nodule in this particular patient. So we have the EEG onset here. So the left nodule produces these patients habitual seizures. And by that I mean that it produces the patient's typical uh, seizure symptoms. And what is reassuring and gratifying to see in this particular patient is that the clinical onset, as denoted by this red arrow, is many seconds after the EEG discharge uh, starts in the nodule. And what's of further interest is that the clinical symptoms start roughly around the time that the seizure discharge spreads to the temporal lobe of this particular patient. And that explains why on the scalp EEG we saw a temporal lobe discharge uh, in this patient on the surface EEG. So it's worth bearing in mind um, that these nodules have very little gray matter and therefore the recordings need to be amplified. As you can see here in these bottom channels, the settings are a little different from the rest of the brain. So we blow up uh, the recordings here so as to see the seizure discharge clearly. If this is not done, then sometimes the true seizure onsets can be missed uh, and um, a, a false conclusion uh, derived of seizures actually starting elsewhere in the brain and not the nodule. It's also worth bearing in mind that seizures spread uh, from the nodule to other nodules uh, and to other parts of the brain can be extremely quick uh, in the tens of milliseconds. And again, um, it requires careful analysis of these seizures to see where indeed the seizures have started. And here I'll hand back to Dr. Tendon about how we treat these nodules. So thank you, Dr. Latu. As, uh, as you've just seen, uh, the seizures can be exquisitely localizable to deep structures in the brain. And as I alluded to previously, we are fortunate to be at this point in time where we have techniques that allow us not to just to record from these deep structures, but also to target them. Uh, so this laser probe is, is implanted into the brain and it emits a type of light that is high energy and destroys tissue right around it. This probe is placed with great precision into the brain using uh, either a stereotactic frame or a robot to target the nodular area of interest. And once it's in the brain, the patient is taken to the MRI machine where we obtain scans in real time as the laser is turned on.
and we can detect the effect of the laser on the destruction of the brain tissue around it in, and optimize that destruction while minimizing damage to surrounding normal structures. And so, uh, as you can see here, you could heat something very rapidly and instantaneously vaporize it, but what we prefer is to keep it somewhere in the modest range, a moderate range, where we can visualize this destruction in real time using this technique uh, of measuring temperature inside the MRI machine. And this particular type of destruction creates a very sharp boundary where tissue is destroyed. This is just outside the scanner on a piece of meat uh, where the destruction produced by the laser is very sharply contoured and normal tissue around it is relatively spared. And this is different from another technique that has been historically used for destruction of these lesions by the passing electricity or what we call radio frequency lesions uh, through the same electrodes used to pinpoint where the seizures are coming from. That technique, also effective, produces a much less predictable damage map and that one that has broader boundaries of areas that are damaged but not necessarily destroyed. So for those two advantages, for a very sharp delineation as well as for real-time monitoring of the ablation, we use laser uh, interstitial thermal therapy. This is in real time. Uh, this is the kind of image we see in the MRI machine as ablation is carried out at a given spot. Uh, the, the sheath inside which the laser is uh, implanted lies in this axis, and then we pull the laser back to produce a tubular zone of ablation uh, of this uh, nodule that you can see here uh, on the MRI scan. Once this ablation is done, we can look at what, that, what we've accomplished by giving the patient a small dose of a contrast agent which outlines the boundaries of the ablation and we check to make sure that that conforms to the nodule. And this is the MRI of the patient that Dr. Latou has presented. And then this is the same patient's MRI scan now obtained six months after the initial ablation. So here you can see the nodule that was causing all this trouble for all these years and now you can see the more recent MRI scan in the after pictures showing that there is no more abnormality. So we've done this successfully for a very large number of patients with periventricular nodular heterotopia. We have 34 patients that we've fully treated so far. Uh, 10 were evaluated and treated with the older technique of subdural grid evaluations and 24 have had the SEEG combined with either a resection or a nodular ablation and as you can see, the outcomes are exceptionally good, especially in the cases that are unilateral, uh, where 91% have a good outcome. And the cases that have bilateral, the disease obviously is broader. The good outcome rates are around 75%. And we're in the process of formalizing these results for distribution to the uh, community of epileptologists and surgeons. Given our significant uh, experience with this disorder, we have created a center of excellence for the evaluation and treatment of patients with periventricular nodular heterotopia, which includes uh, genetics evaluations, uh, genetic counseling, and consultation with relevant specialists in other fields, uh, depending on the entire syndrome that they present to us with. So with that, I would like to thank the extensive teams that make all this work possible, our, our excellent neurology group, um, um, that are shown in the top panel there, Dr. Elliot Friedman, who's our radiologist, and, uh, and our pediatric colleagues, our pathologists, all of whom play a vital role in our uh, efforts to um, take care of this complex disorder. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for your attention.